Welcome to the stage, investor, advisor, and former NFL player, Dahani Jones. What's up, Summit? Oh, I'm going to need another one. Look, it's 930 at night. I need you all to bring that energy. What's up, Summit? All right. I've been coming to Summit for over a decade. It's a long time. But guess what? Over that decade, you dreamers and doers have been changing the entire trajectory of the entire world. In our daily life, things that people have created have come from the Summit community. And it has changed the way that we look at society. It's changed the way that we've done things in society. And it's your responsibility to continue doing so. So if I haven't met you yet, I will. Because I'm excited about meeting you. Now, our next guest, I'm so excited to hear about his story. Because I was sitting in my house on the couch. And I was watching the TV screen. And I saw a guy named Elon Musk come across my screen. And I was like, wow, that's Elon Musk. But the amazing thing about what I saw was that right next to him was one of the most important people that is changing the trajectory of our society. He is allowing us to see the distant and beyond. He is providing us visibility into the future of our society. He is a Michigan graduate. He manages over a thousand people. He takes care of more than a tenth of SpaceX. He runs that Falcon Heavy. He is the VP of launch, and he is my close personal friend, Kiko Donchev. Damn, Dahani with the intro. Uh, I, um, dude, what an event, man. Plus, I feel like I'm doing this talk for my friends now, you know, which makes it much easier. I went from this chat with Zabrukin to a dance party, to dinner, to a dance party, to talk about rockets. So we're going to keep this light. We're going to have fun. Um, it's 9.30. It's Friday night. Uh, let's have a good time. Who wants to watch some rocket videos?
Man, watch out, that big screen got me jacked. So, um, most people know us by SpaceX, but I actually think it's really important to talk about our full name, and that's Space Exploration Technologies. And the reason for that is most people think we're a rocket company. We're actually an exploration company. I also like to say we're an infrastructure company. It just so happens that the place we wanna go explore and the infrastructure we wanna build it is on another planet and on other celestial bodies, right? So obviously our focus is on transportation, but that's really the core of our company is to be explorers and to push human boundaries and technologies farther than they've ever gone before. With that said, we gotta get there. So our current focus is on building rockets and vehicles. Now, I'm gonna show you the family we've got uh, of vehicles. First, a human for reference. Next, the Millennium Falcon, about 35 meters. Honestly, always felt bigger on Star Wars to me. In the middle is Falcon 9. That's our main uh, rocket, the one we're flying every day and the one we're gonna talk a little bit about um, and how it really accelerated launch rate. The reason it's called the Falcon, by the way, is actually named after Millennium Falcon. And the reason it's called Falcon 9 is because we have nine Merlin engines that power it. On top of Falcon, you can either put a Dragon, that's a capsule that can take cargo or crew to the International Space Station or low Earth orbit, or you can put a fairing, which basically means you can fly any sort of satellite or payload that you want, uh, depending on where you want to go. Falcon Heavy is basically three Falcon 9s put together. It's 27 engines. It's really meant for super heavy satellites or maybe something that's interplanetary that you want to send to Jupiter or Mars. And then last but not least, Starship. Starship for scale is basically just Falcon Heavy or Falcon 9 fits on just the top part of Starship, right? Starship's got uh, the vehicle on top plus the super heavy booster. Now, all of these vehicles the place we've put most of our innovation has been in reusability and making rockets reusable. Falcon 9 is an evolutionary technology when it comes to reusability. Starship will fundamentally change the game and change the way we live and will truly set us up to be a spacefaring civilization. Yeah. So to, let's focus on Falcon now for a little bit. So we're gonna do, we're gonna try to keep this as least not technical as possible and we'll go quick through that part. But basically a rocket's three parts. The first stage, that's from where the engines are to the top of the black part. That's the part that basically gets you up out of the atmosphere and um, starts to accelerate you to orbit. The second stage, that's that part from the top of the black part to basically where those two clamshells are. That's the second stage. That's the part that delivers the payload to the orbit it's gonna get. And then there's the fairings. The fairings are just two halves. They sit on top of the satellite and they protect you uh, when you're on the pad and as you're going through the atmosphere before they deploy and fall back to Earth. Now, when you buy, if you build an airplane, an airplane's fully reusable, right? You fly a flight from LAX to Miami, the plane lands, the people get off, the maintenance crew comes out, they refuel the plane, it takes off, people get back on, it takes off. Now, imagine if that plane flew from LAX to Miami and along the way, the wings fell off, the tail fell off, the other half of the plane fell off, and the only thing that landed at the end of the runway was just a few slides with the people in it, right? You just spent $250 million on a one-way trip. It's kind of like not very scalable and not very affordable. Fundamentally, that's what rockets have been for effectively the last 50 years until Falcon 9 came around, right? And what we started doing is figure out how to land that first stage. And by figuring out how to land that first stage and land those fairings and bring them back and start reusing that hardware, we are able to fundamentally start to accelerate what launch looked like. So let's kind of walk through the history of all the launches we've been doing. So we started with just this little itty bitty rocket called Falcon 1 that we launched off uh, an island in the, in the South Pacific called Omelek early on 2008 and 2009. Then we built our pads at the Cape, just three hours north of here, um, at Slick 40 and 39, two historic launch pads, and also one out in Vandenberg, Slick 4E. <clears throat> now, we had two launches in 2010, but we were fundamentally limited because we had to basically produce all of the hardware. We weren't able to catch the rockets, we weren't able to go reuse the vehicles yet, and that really slowed our pace. So you kind of see like 2012, Launch one, we launched two, we're still learning. 2013, okay, maybe we can start to launch a couple more. Still a huge gap. We go through some development challenges, a couple failures. 2014, 
15, we start to pick up the pace a little bit. Then we have an accident. That accident, unfortunately, slows us down for a little bit, right around, right around where we stop here after 2015. But then when we get back to flight on 2016, for the first time, the rocket comes down. And it comes down in one piece. And as soon as that happens, we start to pick our pace up. Because all of a sudden, you went from having to produce all of these machines to being able to reuse, refly, and just focus on maintaining the ones you have. All of a sudden, throwing a rocket away became an unacceptable thing to do. And our pace picked up faster and faster and faster. But even, just go back to 2019, we've really only ended up launching like 15, 16 times until we had this dire need, which we'll talk about shortly, which was we had a satellite internet constellation that we really wanted to launch. We needed to launch a lot of satellites and we needed to launch it very, very fast. So we put an immense focus on picking that pace up even more. Focus on our usability, go faster and faster and faster, more launches from a launch every two weeks to a launch every week to a launch every five days to by the end of last year and the start of this year, a launch every four and three days. We're launching so fast that I made these charts last week and they're already out of date because we've added two flights to this. So um, over the history, since we started launching rockets, we've flown 224 missions, 184 boosters that we've recovered. We've reflown those boosters 155 times and we've recovered 230 fairings. The reason we've recovered more fairings and missions is because there's two fairings per rocket launch. So what does that look in a different way? We Basically, we flew a record number of time in 2022, 61 times. Effectively, we flew less new rockets than we did in 2014, but yet we launched almost, man, I don't even remember what the number is, but 10 times the amount effectively than we did at that time. And you can see what that difference of being able to reuse your vehicles and really pick the pace up. That's the game changer. That's the evolutionary technology that Falcon is, right? No one's even coming close to this, but it's the key to making space flight aircraft flight. Like I said, record number last year. This year we're at 32 as of this morning. For those that were lucky enough to be looking outside at 2.15, you could actually see one, um, which was pretty cool. I didn't want to advertise it because I was um, nervous that you wouldn't be able to see it and it'd be like a big disappointment. It was actually pretty rad though, um, to see it streaking through the sky. Um, and, and now we're kind of set up for 100. Now, we talked about reuse, but we do have a process at SpaceX. Like how do we innovate? How do we drive technology forward? And what is our approach to innovating with technology that's never been done before? And we have what's called the algorithm. And Elon really built this, with, he really built this through his experience at Tesla and, and now SpaceX, but kind of high rate manufacturing, hard design, hardcore design problems. Step one, make the requirements less dumb. When you're fundamentally innovating a new technology, you're wrong. It's just a question of how wrong because your ability to learn is changing constantly. And so where you start is certainly not where you're gonna end up. Another way to think about this is that your, like your innovation is basically having it at such a rapid state that there are constraints that have been put on you maybe a year or two or three years ago from some department or some place. And you naturally, like your first natural inclination is to go in and be like, okay, I got this problem. What are the like constraints like X, Y, you know, if someone told me it's like this heavy or it's gotta cost this much money. But fundamentally, a lot of times those constraints and requirements have been driven by a department or a human three years ago that like isn't even around anymore. So if you're ever facing a problem and someone's giving you constraints, make sure you ask, Who's the person that gave me this constraint? Oh, well, it wasn't a person who was this department. Okay, you go to that department. Okay, who in this department said this? Actually, it was like this intern, like <laughs> six months ago that is not even here. I'm like, I don't even know why they exist anymore. So you'd be surprised what happens when you challenge the requirements, right? That's like a, the first thing you gotta go do. The second, delete the part process step or person in the, in the whole thing. Try really, really hard to delete it. Elon always says this, and I like very much believe it because I've seen it happen time and time again. The most common mistake he sees a smart engineer make is optimizing a problem that shouldn't exist in the first place. And the best way to think about this is 
you know, you know, most of you guys went to college, whatever, our education system is built around you're given a test. The test has questions. You have to sit down. You have to answer the questions and then turn your test in. You're not allowed to be, say, like, this is the wrong question, right? Like, this was not, this was not what I was supposed to be asked, right? This was, you're asking me fundamentally the wrong problem, right? And once again, as engineers, we're trained, I'm given a problem, I got to go solve it. You really got to think hard, am I solving the right problem? Because you might actually be optimizing something that you shouldn't be putting effort to. The next is optimize or simplify. Really important, by the way, you run one in steps one and two as many times as possible, and then you jump to step three. Really important, you don't go to step three that fast at, before until you've iterated a couple times. Optimize, try to make them something simple. Once again, common misconception in engineering is something that's complex, is like more reliable or better. It's false. Oftentimes the most simple thing is A, the best design and the most reliable. Complexity, we like to say, is the devil. Um, and oftentimes leads to a much, a much less reliable product, let alone something that you can make many, many times. You know, it's easy to build one rocket, it's very, very hard to build many rockets, right? Easy to launch one rocket, very, very hard to launch a lot of rockets. Doing something at scale with technology, much more difficult. So spending a lot of time optimizing, simplifying, and deleting parts from your product is critical. For Accelerate, you can always go faster than you think you can, hands down. There's always time to gain. There's always efficiencies to be bought. You think you went fast enough, bullshit, you can go faster. I've seen it once again, every time my team's like, dude, we can't go faster. You're like, yes, you can. Move the goalpost. You'd be surprised what happens when you challenge people. Last, but certainly not least, is automate. Automation is an extremely powerful tool, but the reason it's last is if you don't run through that algorithm, you can end up optimizing or, or you can end up automating something that's fundamentally more complex than it should be, and that's gonna slow you down the wrong run. So many times people make this mistake to go to step five before they run through step one. And that's when you end up putting a ton of effort into automation before realizing like, holy smokes, I don't even need this thing in the first place. So let's do an example of how we applied the algorithm at SpaceX. This next video is a very story behind these fairings, right? Elon challenged us one day, right? Because building a fairing is like a, a fairly complex task. It costs about six million bucks. He's like, look guys, imagine you had six million dollars falling from the sky. Would you try and go get it? And we're like, yeah, dude, obviously we're gonna try and go get this money. He's like, all right, then go get fairings right now, right? <laughs> and, um, and at the time we thought, okay, we have to have, we have to catch them with a net, right? We can't take this really <laughs> complex piece of technology and let it fall in the, in the ocean, get super corroded with salt water, and then, you know, have to, basically the part's not gonna work, right? But, and it worked, we did it, right? You basically had this really awesome algorithm, this like crazy automation, the fairing would fly, it had a parafoil and it would steer itself and then the boat would have this automated control that would basically turn and follow and the two would close and that's how you'd, how you'd capture them. But what do you guys notice about this picture? Hold on, what else? Pool, someone said pool. This is like a lake. This is like the Atlantic at the most calm it could ever be, right? The reality is most of the time it's a choppy hot mess with, you know, seven to nine foot waves with super short period and a ton of wind. And so even though we caught it once, our actual success rate from being fairings home was quite low. It was under 50%, 40%, and our ability to get fairings ready to fly again was choking our launch rate. Now in that process, what we found out was fairings actually float pretty darn well. It's composite structure, a sailboat's effectively a composite. It's really just a big boat. And in the process of, of doing that, we're like, well, do we really need to catch them? We challenge that requirement. You don't need to catch the fairings. They float well. 
if we just move some of the parts to the, the higher part of the fairing, even if a little water did get in, it's gonna survive and it's ultimately gonna make it much easier. So we basically said, you know what? We don't need to catch them. We can completely delete the boat, the big net, the automation, all of that stuff. We allow the fairing to just fall into the water. We use a very regular standard crane that comes on one of our recovery vessels to pick the fairing up, put it on the boat. And what happens? We go from less than 50% to a 99% success rate on our fairing recovery. We have more fairings than we have space. We build an entire factory such that a fairing could come in, spend a minimal amount of time being turned around, go back out, go get on top of the rocket. And fairings are a thing we don't even come close to talking about when, when it's time for launch. They're always ready, no problem. Now, that's a good example. I didn't talk about automation much, but there is one, I'll give you guys like, there is one really cool piece of automated equipment. I mean, in general, the rocket, the whole flight is automated, but when you wanna land the vehicle, so a lot of people think going to space, by the way, is just going up, but that's just going to, you get to like effectively the Von Karman line by going to space. But if you wanna to go to orbit, it's actually about going really, going up and going really fast, right? Because the idea is you kinda of gotta, gotta get going 17,500 miles per hour and you gotta be up out of the atmosphere so that the drag doesn't slow you down. And so the way you wanna catch a rocket, you can imagine if you launch off a launch pad, right? If it's a heavy, if it's a pretty light payload, you can have enough fuel to basically turn the rocket around, boost you back, and take you back to land. But if you wanna maximize the amount of stuff you're putting in space, you're basically gonna use as much possible fuel as you can to get it to where it needs to go, and then you're gonna let the rocket fall. And you're gonna let it fall, and you're gonna let it basically go to where it wants to go. As a, and as a, a function of that, and because you launch over water to basically ensure you don't overfly people, you need a way to catch the rocket. So, we happened to create the world's largest autonomous vessel. This is basically a river barge that we took, put a bunch of thrusters on, put our own sort of software and spin on, and created a shortfall of gravitas, completely unmanned vessel. You know, there's no one crewing this at all. And it's able to hold its position. Coast Guard won't let us do this, but could actually just drive itself out um, drive itself out to the landing location, let the rocket land. We have uh, this cool little robot that comes out, grabs the rocket, and then drive it all the way back to port. Uh, we end up using it semi-autonomously, but this is one of the coolest pieces of tech that I think we've done. And you know, you think rockets, you're like, oh man, you like fundamentally changed the rocket game, but it's kind of cool at SpaceX. This is why I like to say we're an infrastructure company. The drone ship in itself was a piece of innovation that without, we wouldn't be nearly as successful with. So why does this matter? Increasing launch rate enabled two primary things. The first one was the ability for us to build a broadband satellite internet constellation that could basically give you internet anywhere on earth. Internet from space for humans. Anywhere. <laughs> the Antarctica picture is like especially um, uh, Special to me, I actually got to go to Antarctica super lucky in February, and I have two little kids, a one and three year old, and the boat was like, we have, they were like, do not plan on using any internet. I was like, nah, I got you. And I actually brought a terminal with us, and uh, we like set it up on the back of the boat, and everyone was able to use it, and we were able to FaceTime our kids, you know, um, which was really special. I've worked on a lot of cool things at SpaceX, human space flight. I've had the sort of opportunity to like really be on the forefront of a lot of the technology. Building Starlink was the first time I felt like I was really changing the lives of everyday people. Giving access to education, to healthcare, um, you know, allowing people to you know, visit their loved ones if they're sick and they can't go to the hospital. Like literally the stories you hear just like make your heart so warm and make you so proud that like, man, I didn't just like build something for some, you know, just like the, the government or something like that. I build something that like is changing people's lives. We have a pretty cool video that shows um, some of those examples. Uh, yeah, this is crazy. A lot of people don't realize this, but. I think it's now mounted. And this little dish sits outside. Vicky, the trainer and I'm in your styling. Snow, frost, high winds, you name it. Myself, that roaming. Got my pole mounted Starlink here. I'm gonna do a Starlink unboxing. Starting your way. Go Starlink, go Falcon 9. What? What? A 
Satellite Wi-Fi right here. We're going to be using in emergency situations when people need to communicate. Satellite Wi-Fi right here. We're going to be using in emergency situations when people need to communicate. Satellite Wi-Fi right here. We're going to be using in emergency situations when people need to communicate. on my computer, off of a battery, online, on the Starlink. Dude, yeah, you be, people are wacky, man, when it comes to getting their internet, it's amazing. Internet was rad. The other thing that was really awesome is our flight rate has really helped us pick up human space flight um, in this country. And, um, you know, we're just a little under three years from when we were able to return humans uh, to low Earth orbit. So, you know, most people don't know, 2011, the shuttle retired. Between 2011 and 2020, America was paying the Russians a little over $90 million a seat just to get us to the space station, right? Um, SpaceX won a contract, put a lot of focus into basically developing um, a 21st century spaceship in Dragon. And uh, on uh, May 30th, 2020, we launched Bob and Doug, which was the start of our human spaceflight program. nine today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. Bob and Doug were really like flying those two. I mean, they're, they're both, we always like to say dads in space. They're both like two dads. Um, and, and it was a really special and awesome moment to get them to space. But the thing that's like really neat right now about Dragon is that it's not just trained professionals anymore. And we've really gotten to the point where private space flight, private human space flight is taking off at a level that we've never seen before. And I think we're really close to being exponential on that curve. Um, this mission, I think, is still one of the coolest things we've done. This is called, this was in the Inspiration4 mission. It launched September 15, 2021. Um, it was a project that was uh, funded by a guy named Jared Isaacman, he started a company Shift4, um, and generally has a passion for doing cool things. And one might think, you know, most um, sort of wealthy people that want to go to space, kind of like a bunch of, I hate to put it this way, a bunch of white dudes on a capsule going and just like going for a joyride. Jared had a much bigger mission. He wanted to raise money and awareness for uh, children's cancer research. And basically he wanted to partner with St. Jude's and basically see if this mission could generate funding to help change the lives of children that were dealing with illness. And so he put on this Inspiration4 mission and he picked a crew of just regular humans. So Jared himself is that. The, 
Um, woman in the middle, Haley Arsenal. She is the first cancer survivor to ever go to orbit. Also the youngest female to also go to orbit. Really, really rad um, girl from, from Tennessee, I believe. Cyan Proctor, Dr. Proctor, a scientist and artist from Arizona that once wanted to be an astronaut, or an astronaut and tried to apply to the candidacy but never made it. She won her, so Haley, Haley got in as sort of a representative of St. Jude's. Um, Dr. Proctor won by a competition because her company used Shift 4. And then Chris Zembrowski, just like your down the middle, average American guy that um, didn't actually win the sweepstakes. His buddy was like a sweepstakes, you pay a hundred bucks, you get a number of entries or whatever. His buddy won the sweepstakes and was like, dude, I don't want to do this, but <laughs> like, do you want to go to space? So imagine getting that phone call if your friend's like, yo, look, I just want a trip to space, but I can't go. You gotta like show up to this thing in a little bit. Like, I think it's gonna be cool. Um, and Chris was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I'll get it. Um, and uh, they put this mission on, right? And these are not trained professionals. These are like everyday humans. And, uh, and they raised $250 million for St. Jude's and for children's research, which is awesome. And then the next video is really awesome. You kind of saw like Bob and Doug act. Here is what happens when you take these four civil astronauts and you put them in the capsule with the largest window we've ever, ever built in space and they open it up for the first time to look at Earth. So um, that was really special. So Jared has a follow-on mission called Polaris Dawn planned, uh, where we're gonna do the first um, planned spacewalk with Dragon. I'm not gonna lie, this picture makes me nervous. Um, it's like, who's been, who's been skydiving? All right, you guys know when like, they open the door and you're like, eh, I don't know if I wanna jump out of this like, perfectly good airplane. Same kind of vibes, you know, um, <laughs> in my opinion. But uh, I'm confident we're gonna get it done safely. Um, and it's gonna be really special and, and there's some really exciting things that are gonna come around this mission. You know, one of the last points I wanna make about this vehicle is like private space flight is here now. This is not something that's like far off in the future. Um, and you know, I know this is generally a bunch of successful people, so if it's something you're interested in, we should talk about it. Um, there's plenty, like honestly, like I think you're gonna see private space flight really take off over the next five, you know, five to 10 years. Um, so if you're inspired by it, you really should consider an opportunity to, to go to orbit and look down on earth and just realize how precious the place is that we have and we're saving. I don't know if you guys have heard of the overview effect, but it's a feeling that most astronauts get when they leave and go to low earth orbit or they've gone beyond low earth orbit and they look back at earth and you realize just how fragile this one little planet that we're all while living on is, right? It's mothership earth is actually a spaceship hurling through space at millions of miles per hour and through the universe. So, but if you wanna to go to Mars, you're not gonna to wanna to take the minivan. You're gonna to wanna to take the really sweet bus, which is tour bus, which is Starship. Dragon, Falcon, evolutionary technologies. We throw that second stage away. We're designing Starship to be fully and rapidly reusable. The vehicle launches both sections. So you've got the ship on top, super heavy on the bottom. You launch, booster comes back, ship comes back, you refuel and you go again. 
It's all about making spaceflight aircraft flight. Without that step function, we're never going to be a spacefaring civilization. So it's fundamental that we get that piece of technology right. On the way there, though, there will be some excitement. So we just had our test flight. Um, it was exciting, as most people know, but for us, you know, the way we approach technology, we want to learn and we want to fail fast. We want to go as fast as possible. Uh, people don't understand the scale of this vehicle. It's effectively almost the size of the stage just in diameter. It feels uncomfortable standing next to it. It's the world's biggest rocket by far, bigger than, air, bigger than the Artemis rocket had just launched, bigger than Saturn V, a lot more thrust, but it's what's necessary to drive the economies of scale low enough such that we can truly actually push exploration farther. We gotta break that barrier, we gotta go back to the moon, we, gotta go, we did that in 69, it's about time we put humans back on the moon and we help kind of deliver that future where we can go a little bit farther. A lot of people ask me, like, you worry about space, you know, what about Earth? We obviously have a lot of problems. There's plenty of problems and there's plenty of talent to go around for both of these things. And I truly believe, and we truly believe, that a future in which we're a spacefaring civilization is an exciting one. And I actually think one in which we've taken care of our own planet. We're in the small window of time where we're actually gonna be able to do this. And I think if we accomplish this goal, it actually means we've also solved our problems on Earth. So it's late, it's Friday night. We're gonna make life multi-planetary. We're gonna skip Q&A tonight. Come find me later if you wanna talk. Thank you guys.